Good morning, folks. Thanks for the great response to yesterday's climate video and for letting me sleep in past 4 a.m. for the first time since 2011. Let's kick it to Fukushima. This is an animation provided by TEPCO. It is part of a much longer explanation video linked for you below about the rod removal process about to take place. The process is complicated because the material can be volatile in exposed atmosphere and if something goes wrong during the process, it could be worse than the initial disaster. World took notice when Arnie Gunderson and others explained the hazards of the cleanup effort last month. There are already a host of concerns about negligence from decades ago complicating the process today. It's going to be a top thing to watch while it's taking place. Gotta do a bit of a reality check, seeing a lot of claims like this lately, saying the UN and IPCC admit chemtrails and say that we must continue. Such claims are used to sell advertisements like these. The latest IPCC report does not warn against stopping chemtrails. That article was citing the policy maker's summary, where they described the dangers of stopping solar radiation management once it had begun, meaning it was a hypothetical argument, a reason for potentially not doing it in the future. And indeed, if you take the time to go pull the full draft report, the actual beast of a document submitted to the UN, they're confirming their long-held claims that chemtrails and other aspects of SRM have never been implemented. Vitally important topic, but poor reporting makes us all look crazy. Also linked for you below is a combo NASA, USGS, and Landsat project to track and characterize deforestation. You'll probably spend a half hour on that one alone. Starwater in the news as well, confirmation of some hypotheses and purported circumstances. It's not just the solar wind that contains heavy elements. Hint, take Starwater and the recent Kepler data and go tackle the Drake equation. Ison, in outburst, major naked eye visibility. We expect to learn if the nucleus survived over the next few days. Bruce Gary and SpaceWeather.com covering it very well. Top weather watch is for the early fall Indian flood zones. At the coastline and one lined up right after another. More of the map covered here than I've seen in a while. Seems multiple locations have potential for severity. Meanwhile you see a low heading west over Espana y Portugal as another one is pushed over the UK. The US tonight will watch a ton of cold moisture head south and southeast. The snow out west, but where that mixes with lower level heat and moisture driven north from the Gulf, we might actually get some severe weather tonight in the central and midwest states. Solar flaring actually coming back a bit this morning, taking another minor M flare. Sunspots though are in decay. Backside development has left the large northern group while his lead is small and undeveloped. Down south, decay continues and the deltas are diminishing, the leading bunch actually looking the better despite the quiet. Solar wind, not to be outdone, the most significant interplanetary shock in a while, and even though the KP hasn't shown it yet, the electron flux does show the disturbance could result in a magnetic storm if the density holds out. With near-Earth energy on high, Earth currently is crossing through nearly two simultaneous oppositions, between Jupiter and Venus, and between Ceres and Uranus. The departing coronal hole up top is part of a larger complexion, a mid-watch lull lasted 48 hours, but as the field set to close. The southern holes, even though slightly blocked visibly by umbral fields, is of major, major power, making all three quake factors in play last night. Bottom of the world rocking again, the Scotia Sea near Antarctica won up their six-pointer from earlier in the week. Japan and Pakistan also taking significant upticks, potential foreshocks. Eyes open, no fear, it's 6.40 a.m. Eastern Time and that's the news. Be safe everyone.